Hello, everyone. You're listening to the award-winning podcast, The Social Contract, now in its second season. I'm Tavia. I'm George. I'm Cleo. And I'm Maya. Welcome to this episode of The Social Contract, the new way to Saturday. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. That's a quote from First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Thanks, Maya. What a great quote to kick off this episode. Last time, the two Gs, Georgie and Gigi, met Theodore Roosevelt. In this episode, they jump ahead a few decades to meet Theodore's cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But first, I wanted to share some exciting news from across the pond. The book upon which this podcast is based, Presidential Conversations for Kids by George S. Corey and the artist Cleo, is now available in the UK. To roll out PC4K, as well as the grown-up edition of the book, simply called Presidential Conversations, to their fans in Great Britain, George and Cleo will be the special guests on the hit British podcast, The Chronicles of Podcast. The Chronicles hosts Tom Stevens and Jamie Westwood will be devoting the entire episode to the Presidential Conversations universe, the books, the podcast, and of course, George and Cleo themselves. The episode premieres Friday, June 16th, one week ahead of our JFK episode right here on The Social Contract. Sounds like the perfect start to the summer holidays to me. We'll keep you posted, kids. Now, to start things off, let's hear from Cleo about the amazing word art that both inspired and accompanies this episode. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This famous quote from FDR gives me chills. So the word art that inspired this episode is no fear. To me, no fear means no hate because fear and hate go hand in hand. We all know what it's like to be afraid of something. Sometimes we can even be afraid of doing the right thing. But as FDR shows us, taking a stand for what is right, even in the face of fear, is how we win hearts and minds. Well said, Cleo. Remember, kids, you can find Cleo's latest word art and illustrated transcripts at mytscpodcast.com. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or simply FDR, was America's 32nd president from 1933 to 1945. He was the only president elected four times in 1932, 1936, 1940, and 1944. Since 1951, a president can only be elected to two terms. What was he like as a kid? Franklin was an only child, born into tremendous wealth in Hyde Park, New York. He loved to read, and living on an estate, he also enjoyed being outdoors. Franklin attended Harvard, where he was a cheerleader and editor-in-chief of the school's newspaper. In 1905, he married his wife, Eleanor, who would go on to become one of the most admired and accomplished first ladies in history. The Roosevelts owned what may have been the most famous first dog, a Scottish terrier named Fala. When some of his political opponents complained that President Roosevelt used taxpayers' money to retrieve the dog, who had been accidentally left behind on a foreign trip, FDR said, These Republican leaders have not been content with attacks on me or my wife or my sons. They now include my little dog Fala. I am accustomed to hearing malicious falsehoods about myself, but I object to nasty statements about my dog. Fala, who makes an appearance in this episode, is buried next to his master at the home of Franklin D. Roosevelt National Historic Site in Hyde Park. He truly was this president's best friend. Most historians agree that FDR was a great president one of the reasons he was able to be great was because the times in which he led demanded nothing less. The nation needed extraordinary leadership, 
as it faced two almost insurmountable challenges, and FDR triumphantly led America through both. When he became president in 1933, America's economy was so bad it was called the Great Depression. Many people lost their jobs, their homes, and couldn't afford to feed their families. Even though Roosevelt himself was from an exceptionally wealthy family, he cared very much about regular Americans. He created an unprecedented number of social programs that were designed to help the poor, sick, and elderly. Even though the economy didn't recover immediately, FDR delivered the strength, optimism, and courage Americans needed to get through these very hard times. The world was a dangerous place in 1941. Nazi Germany, Italy, and Japan were attacking other countries without provocation, and the Nazis were also killing millions of innocent people, mostly Jewish. America had already gone through the First World War, which ended in 1918, and it was in no rush to get into another world war. FDR would not go to war without the support of the American people. And when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii on December 7, 1941, the country united around Roosevelt's decision to join the Allied forces. Which takes us to the next chapter in our story, as Georgie and Gigi slide into the year 1941. Let's listen. Georgie and Gigi rolled down a busy street in Washington, D.C. Everything was now in black and white, like an old movie. A motorcade was making its way down the avenue. Check it out, G, Georgie said. They made cars the size of school buses back then. Inside a big old-timey convertible, a man's gloved hands held a newspaper in front of his face. The two Gs squinted to make out the date on the paper's front page. December 6th, 1941. Then the newspaper dropped to reveal Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States. Look, it's FDR! The president we just learned about in school, exclaimed Gigi. And he's writing in the Sunshine Special. Remember? That's the nickname everybody called his tricked-out presidential convertible. Yeah, and do you remember what tomorrow is? Oh, no, said Gigi, trembling. December 7th, 1941. The attack on Pearl Harbor. That's what led the United States into World War II. OMG, what are we going to do? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself, declared Georgie, repeating FDR's famous line from his first inaugural address. We have to be fearless, just like FDR. Come on, we've got to warn him. As the Sunshine Special rode past them, Georgie and Gigi tried to catch up, but they never got the chance to warn FDR. Just as they were picking up speed, they jumped time and space and suddenly found themselves in the most famous room in the White House. The Oval Office. It was one day later, December 7th, 1941. Georgie and Gigi were alone. Everything around them still looked like it was in a black and white movie. It reminded them of The Wizard of Oz, how the movie started in black and white. They remembered watching it with Marie, huddled together on the couch under a big blanket. Georgie still had nightmares about the Wicked Witch of the West and her flying monkeys. Gigi, on the other hand, delighted in every minute of the movie. She imagined herself playing Dorothy on stage, clicking her ruby slippers together and singing over the rainbow under a spotlight. A small dog scurried up to them from out of nowhere. Gigi scooped him up in her arms and kissed the top of his head. We're definitely not in Kansas anymore. And that's definitely not Toto, said Georgie. FDR's Scottish terrier Fala jumped out of Gigi's arms and led the children down a ramp. The ramp had been built to accommodate the president's wheelchair, which he used occasionally on account of having polio. Fala led the way, and the two Gs followed on the skateboard. The sturdy ramp made for a seamless trip to President Roosevelt's study. The mood in the room, lined with important-looking people, many dressed in military uniforms, was very serious. 
No one even noticed as Georgie, Gigi, and Fala quietly entered. President Roosevelt had just been told about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. His New Deal was leading America out of its greatest economic danger yet, the Great Depression. Now, there was an even greater danger. America had been attacked by Japan. And four days later, Nazi Germany, led by Adolf Hitler, would declare war on America. I'm going before Congress tomorrow, Roosevelt said. Time to write a speech. His secretary, Grace Tully, took notes as Roosevelt began to speak. He chose his words and even punctuation marks very carefully. Roosevelt began, Yesterday, comma, December 7th, comma, 1941, dash, a date which will live in infamy. Hey, gee, Gigi whispered as she nudged Georgie. I feel so bad. I want to tell him that everything's going to be okay, that we're going to win the war. Okay, Georgie whispered back, but let's not interrupt him. Let him finish writing his speech first. As thrilling as this adventure was, Gigi, like Dorothy, yearned for home. She kicked the heels of her sneakers together, not thinking anything of it. And in a flash, the two Gs were at Georgie's house, sitting on the couch in the TV room. I just have to say, I'm on the edge of my seat. And I am in love with Stephen DeRosa's narration. As someone who is a huge fan of The Wizard of Oz, who isn't? I also love how George Corey infused this story with some very clever allusions to Dorothy and Toto and that whole other magical world. For this episode, Maya prepared some very fun Wizard of Oz themed trivia questions. I'm ready, kids. Are you? Okay, first question. In the movie The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's ruby slippers were originally supposed to be another color. Was it A, green, B, blue, or C, silver? If you guess C, silver, you've got the right answer. Here's my second question. In the movie, the Tin Man's oil can didn't actually contain oil. What was in it? A, root beer, B, chocolate syrup, or C, hot sauce? That was a tough one. The answer is B, chocolate syrup. Now for my last question, how much did the Cowardly Lion's costume weigh? A, 20 pounds, B, 50 pounds, or C, 100 pounds? Wow, that was one heavy costume. The correct answer is C, 100 pounds. That was fun, Maya. I got two out of three, not bad. That's worth a silver star, right? Like Dorothy's silver slippers. Now here's George with a very personal reflection on what inspired him as he sat down to write the story you just heard about FDR. FDR is my favorite president, which actually made it tough to write about him. To me, one of the most remarkable things about him is that he suffered a severe trauma, polio, which eventually confined him to a wheelchair. The polio could have made him depressed or even destroyed him. Instead, I believe it gave him the inner strength he needed to save the country. So when something really bad happens to you, I hope that you kids will think about FDR and find your inner strength I also hope you'll remember Cleo's words in beautiful art. No fear. That brings us to the conclusion of our fifth episode. We welcome you to follow The Social Contract wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Remember, new episodes drop on the last Saturday of the month. It's the new way to Saturday. We hope you'll catch us next on June 24th, when Georgie and Gigi meet President John F. Kennedy. I hope you're as excited about that one as I am. In the meantime, check out our website at mytscpodcast.com. 
The Social Contract Podcast is created by George S. Corey and Cleo. Produced and hosted by Tavia Gilbert. Music courtesy of Listen Audio. Mix and master by Kayla Elrod. Additional dialogue editing by Kathleen Conti, with additional episode editing by Brian Wilson. Social manager, Suzette Burton. Production coordinator, Tatiana Bacchus. This has been a podcast from Listen Audio in association with TalkBox Productions. On behalf of George, Cleo, Stephen, Maya, and me, Tavia, thank you for listening.